We found each other first on the Discord channel for the survival horror game online community. We all loved each other very much. It was pure, immaculate teamwork. So convincing that we knew our sovereignty was just a step away. And we knew that if we channeled the same energy into building a cloud country, we could live together happily ever after. Our angel investor then descended upon us. And he seeded our hopes and dreams and aspirations with a generous $5 million initial offering. And he never revealed his face to us. And this very subtle gesture commenced the accumulation of our faith. And when the whole world was falling apart, we found our own enclaves across the internet. And with our own laws, rules, economic model, decision-making processes, we acquired our own data infrastructure. One share, one vote. Words between us were just boundaries, because we all spoke the same language, even if our syntaxes were worlds and eras apart. And we made our own currency. We launched a society funded by subscription and seniorage. And this is the first time I truly loved my neighbors. And our cloud sovereignty was itching to come down to earth. For we weren't content with the nomadic lifestyle of early 21st century. We wanted to be together, in the flesh. So we set off for unexplored territories, for the promised land, promised to us by our anonymous angel investor. We are here with a token of friendship, we said to those who tended the land and spoke the strange local language. We're here to generate more jobs. Let us run this place, same as we run our company, a society based on the principle of freedom. If you don't like it, you're free to leave. You don't have to take those jobs. Let us be part of the solution. We want to be part of the solution. Are you there? Are you there? Can you hear me? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can, can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. I was saying, last year, my skin used to get sticky and itchy when I touched another person. Whenever I got too close. Now it feels like I'm covered in oil. They must have changed the settings of the dome. Yes, I, I can't remember the last time I felt anxious, but the area is so thin, it makes no difference. Maybe you become calmer if there is less air. Did they change the Admiral's column? Looks like he's standing on a higher column. Yeah, you can imagine them shouting, more, 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 higher, when they raise the hi Admiral high up, almost reaching into space. The weight of the Admiral's body, his skeleton and his robe are resting on the back foot. His hips are soft, his spine serpentine, and his calves beautiful. Columbus looks relaxed and pretty. And beneath him, land rises up in a tall column. And around the base, reliefs tell his story. So, the universal harmony of this body rests on the back foot. It is his right arm, the arm of truth and goodness. Single hands stretched out in solo prayer that is pointing into nothingness. And he's saying, come my friends, it is not too late to seek a newer world. It may be that the gulfs will wash us down. It may be we shall touch the happy isles. Yet our purpose holds to sail beyond the sunset. He never pointed at anything when it was still in its original spot in Barcelona. I checked. It didn't point at the new world. What was the new world again in 1492? Do you want some water? Um, was it South America or Dubai or Hong Kong? Was it Palestine? The water, if it is water, is it water? 
It kind of tastes like gum and hummus. Do you reckon he's pointing at utopia or eternal life? Immutable money, some kind of infinite frontier? Shall we just have some Clarin instead? Yeah, let's have a bottle of Clarin. Perhaps they thought it doesn't matter for as long as it's just a guy, it's just a statue pointing at something or other. For as long as the Columbus statue stands tall and stable. Like the gorgeous ethereal equilibrium of the market. The calm beauty of stability. That needs no external orientation through an ontological master. Only oriented by their moral compass. Only oriented by their theory of moral sentiments. I was reading this book on the origins of LARPing um, for this job interview I did in the Market LARP Quarter and did you know that the Liberals designed the first LARP? They, lim they LARPed sympathy with other people's misery. Self-love and sympathy LARP, like the narcissist, falling in love with himself, thinking it's someone else. Didn't he end up killing himself? Self-love and sympathy LARP formed the perfect equilibrium, and together they lubricated the perfect mathematics of the market. Such a cunning device, the market. Bastards. Its fine measurements work because they tamed our immeasurable feelings. Everything in moderation. Cute. Really cute. Do you think there is something in this sacredness that has a sensual or organizational similarity to religious love? You mean like the love the French felt for their nation state? Or the love of the crowds in Tahrir Square? Actually, have you been to the new development? I was there last week with one of the Eurasian tourist groups. They wanted to see the Pantheon, but the French one was under construction. The Hebron Memorial was shut again, so I showed them the old seasteading institute ruin. Doesn't matter either way, for as long as they can taste origins of something. A friend asked me last year sometime, I can't quite remember. They asked me what the first revolution was and I said, it's the French one. Da. 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 Good evening. I would like to think about the timing of a revolution, or the seeds of a revolution, or the crops of a revolution for that matter. And we're going to start the story in 1790, when a ship sailed into the hot harbor of Le Cap, which is on the north coast of Haiti, or Saint Domingo, as it was then known. And the ship came bearing news of the storming of the Bastille in Paris, which is the starting point of the French Revolution, by many accounts. Saint Domingo was, at that point, the foundation of France's colonial empire and the foremost wealth-producing colony of its time. As the news of the impending fall of the French monarchy spread through the population of Saint Domingo, allegiances and alignments started to shift as poor whites joined mulattoes, and mulattoes turned against blacks, and poor whites started to attack white whites. And the governor and the French state tried to buy allegiances from the mulattoes. And it was in this vacuum that the black population found an opportunity to organize. So, from that perspective, the movement of the butterfly's wing that created the Haitian Revolution were the ideas of natural rights and equality and popular sovereignty of the French Revolution manifesting in the storming of the Bastille. However, it can be argued that the seeds for this revolt were in fact not laid by France by Montesquieu and Rousseau, but three decades earlier by the one-handed orator, guerrilla leader, runaway slave and voodoo priest François Macondal. Macondal was believed to have supernatural powers. He was a Muslim and from Senegal, and like the Prophet Muhammad, he was believed to be able to foresee the future. Some say he was immortal, and he had an in-depth knowledge of plants. In the 1740s and 50s, Macondal and his followers traveled from plantation to plantation, 
poisoning white slave owners and black slaves who sided with them. In 1758, Macondal was burned alive. A punishment for black magic and the destruction of property and property owners. But the ghost of Macondal would haunt the colonies in the years to come, and it would be his ghost guiding the black proletarians in 1791. In Haiti, in the lead up to the revolt, Voodoo became the medium of conspiracy, as C.L.R. James writes in The Black Jacobins from 1963. On August 22nd in the year 1791, a year after the ship came bearing news from the colonial heartland, slaves came together in a forest called Wakayiman. This ceremony was the signal that 12,000 slaves had been waiting for. That night, they set off from the outskirts of Luka, setting fire to plantations, and those in towns would massacre the whites, and the ones on the plains would complete the destruction. Working and living together on large sugar factories had made the slaves the real modern proletarian subjects, more so than any other group. And the revolt was a thoroughly prepared and organized mass movement. Four months into the insurrection, the revolutionary leaders, Louverture, François and Boisson hit a dead end. They had made victories in the advanced north, but the west was still dominated by the counter-revolutionary reconciliation of mulattoes and whites. And they were running out of resources. And famine started to spread among the former slaves. So the revolutionary chiefs planned a betrayal. They drafted a letter to the French assembly to make a peace treaty. C.L.R. James writes, the writer, knowing the temper of the colonists, had even taken the trouble to suggest to them exactly how the slaves were to be bluffed back into bondage. No imperialist of today with 300 years of traditional deception behind him could have garlanded his claws with fairer words. The restoration of the broken equilibrium. As a phrase for slavery would not have disgraced the Mandate's Commission of the League of Nations. Nevertheless, it was the experience of the Haitian Revolution of 1791 that pushed the abstract universalism of natural human rights to its ultimate fulfillment in actualizing human freedom by overthrowing slavery. It was revolutionary slaves, the black proletarians of Santo Domingo, led by voodoo priests and enlightenment thinkers who radicalized the notion of natural rights and exposed the tensions and philosophical contradictions of enlightenment thought in ways that no other historical event of that period could have done. In its particularities, as in its universal qualities, the Haitian Revolution turned on its head the principles and redefined the meaning of freedom.
We are here with a token of friendship, he said to those that tended the land and spoke the strange local languages. We're here to generate more jobs. At first they did resist, but we found some common ground, and their government had already gone bankrupt. And jobs, we knew, and I am sure they knew as well, were better than independence. Before you claim your sovereignty, you first need to eat, naturally. And so they gave in, at least some of them did. But sometimes it seemed as if not all of them were happy. First we were heartbroken by their unhappiness, then we became fearful of their unhappiness. And we started projecting onto their faces the possibility of vengeance. And from those facial projections, we generated facial recognition algorithms. Then checkpoints were installed. It was called the Red Shark Surveillance System. And the Red Shark allowed us to collect data and catalog it and categorize it. And we created a Facebook directory of the local population. One individual, one entry. And it became possible to know much about the lives of the local population, where they lived, what they ate, who they loved, and what they read. The guards and the police had access to this collection, as we did, the residents. It shielded us from all immediate threats. And, I must say, safety and defense became fun. It was important work, but it was easy to enjoy ourselves while keeping ourselves safe. Yellow for interrogation, red for annihilation. And the player would choose. As with every game, everyone's a player, and everyone's played with. Some more, some less. Some more, some less. Not everyone can be the main character. We live in a beautiful zone now. The smartest of cities, the cleanest of cities, the safest and securest of cities. We can devote our time to mapping our history and the history of those who came before us. We have even created a theme park to celebrate the great achievements, the sad losses, the ruins of heroism, and the deathbeds of true poets. We are protected from those locals who have still not accepted the new reality by the screens of the Red Shark. Only a bullet, a knife, a rifle, or a massive prison bank every now and then can break the suspension of disbelief. We keep developing more advanced bulletproof vests and upgraded checkpoints in the meantime. We keep struggling for freedom. We keep fighting for the sovereignty of our utopia. We keep thriving. We keep thriving. We keep thriving. Hey, are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Are you there? I'm here. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. I'm still here. I can hear you. They started running bingo nights again, but the prizes are same as last year. I think they, they must have asked people to return their prizes. Speaking of which, it's your birthday again. It's a balmy 25 degrees. Do you know it's always 25 degrees on your birthday? but that doesn't make it any less special. Aw, oh, thank you. Tomorrow, would you like me to make you some meat for breakfast? You can choose between sausage and sausage meat. I can put it through the sausage maker for you, if you like. In classic Euro fashion, they took it from the Greeks. They took Columbus' stance from the Greeks. And they took the whole idea of the transcendent universal community from the Greeks when they were arguing, arting, killing their way through the French Revolution. They say it began the process of disenchantment, but I think the opposite is the case. I do think they lay the groundwork for a new enchantment. They created a social contract, a people of vitality, passion, Organized like the Catholic Church, because that was the organizational form they knew, I guess. Imagine, their social contract was their enchantment ritual. How they entered their make-believe world. So you sign the social contract, and then the game begins. Almost in a kind of transnational temporal metabolism, it was the suppressed voodoo practices that created spaces for the Haitian revolution to happen. 
And those very spaces the French colonial government was suppressing pushed a revolution that would in turn spin the balls of the mother of all revolutions and infuse it with an urgency and bring forth the most radical, genuinely utopian energy to this space. You know, maybe he's not actually pointing forwards. Maybe he's pointing backwards. Maybe he's pointing to the edges of the enchanted ground. He goes like, within these bounds, the 20th century does not exist. Like those medieval LARPers in the States. So first they LARP the Greeks, and then they LARP the French Revolution, and then they LARP the chiefdom of, of the Middle Ages because they found some kind of island of sweet regression in this space before reason. Like a projection of the not yet, from a mythical daydream of the past into the future. Look at little Tatlin's tower. Whenever the clouds turn rusty peach, it just looks like the sunsets of old again. Beautiful. So beautiful. Then they LARP the Iranian revolution. Then they LARP the Chilean revolution. Then they LARP the Dubai revolt. Then they LARP the Iranian revolution. Then they LARP the Chilean revolution. Then they LARP the Dubai revolt. Then they LARP the Iranian revolution. Then they LARP the Chilean revolution. Then they LARP the Dubai revolt. Then they LARP the Iranian revolution. So you draw on a repertoire of contention, some kind of prop store of revolutionary character masks, a set of instruments and performative gestures a given community has access to, and then you improvise, even though sometimes unfamiliar gestures might work better. You know, I once was a revolutionary myself. Now I'm LARPing revolution for a living in the Iranian quarter. What is it you do exactly? I'm a content creator for the revolution. You pick your role, constitutionalist, Islamist, Marxist, armed or pacifist. You pick an avatar, do the enchantment ritual, which is essentially setting the American embassy on fire. Then the game begins. It's an inclusive space though, right? Totally. But someone always feels left out. And little incentive so they come back and play the game again. Well, cool. Maybe I can take my tourist group there. When are the sessions happening? So the LARPs happen on Tuesdays and Thursdays, loop twice back to back, 1 p.m. and 3 p.m. Um, they suggest you carry a banana with you since it's during lunch hour. That's good to know. I will make sure to send in a request for bananas then. In every repetition though, I do uh, think whether the next loop something else would happen. Like the tank is taking over, or the Shah manages to make a concession with the people and turn it into a parliamentary monarchy. But the Islamists always win. So, it's not actually a very fun game? No, not really. The teleology is ascribed in advance. The end is already set in stone. But secretly, I feel, something happens that's not the game developer's intention. Something happens that makes players feel they can always reappear as another figure to have many returns. That's really beautiful. It's like a different sense of eternity. I know you were involved at some point with LARPing the 70s yourself. You know the neoliberalism 70s. Why don't we join teams at some point? We can anchor it in 1979, the same year that Thatcher came to office, which, you know, I'm always surprised people never acknowledge, coincided with the Iranian revolution. So neoliberalism and political Islam, to each their own spirituality? Two revolutions. But can we call Thatcherism a revolution? I guess we can definitely say it succeeded. But how do we measure the success of a revolution? Hmm. <clears throat> hmm. I suppose you could measure it by seeing if it changed domestic living spaces, for example. You could measure it by the degree of economic autonomy over a territory, for example. You could measure it by the expansion of a vague sense of utopianism. Or you could measure it by the total abolition of private property. You could measure it by asking if it did fundamentally change the way we love. Or 
You can measure it by the death toll. Or you could check if trees can still grow. Or you could look at new as well as historical supply chains. You could measure it by the number of subdivisions on the left. Or you could count the rings. You could measure it by seeing if its aesthetics have become branding already. Or you can measure it by incremental improvements. You could measure it by the manifestations of environmental justice. Or you could measure it by an increase to the subject's capacity to free associate, psychologically, and in society. You could measure it by checking if anyone has tried to repeat it. Or you could measure it in units of collective effervescence. You could measure it by checking if the crisis has been dreamt into eternity. You could measure it by the shift to the society of post-scarcity. Or you could check if there is still enough water but not too much water. You could measure it through prophetic past tense. You could measure it by checking if it constituted a true break from history, from the previous state, from a paternal figure. You could measure it by checking who adorns the monument three generations later. Or you could measure it by the number of people who kept their jobs because they were really sorry. Or you could measure it by checking if reparations are being paid to the living and the dead. You could measure it by the upsurge of martyrdom for the commons, or you could measure it by the size of the civil service. You could measure it by looking at school books, or you could measure it in units of guilt. Or, for example, you could measure it by the number of people hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, rig cattle in the evening, and criticize after dinner. Or you could measure it by seeing if any art has been made about it. You could see if the strategy succeeded. Or you could measure it by looking at plaques, if indeed there are any. You could measure it by observing the changes in the body. You could count the number of cats left in the city. You could measure it by checking if there is still enough water, but not too much water. You could measure it in units of collective effervescence. Or you can measure it by the number of McDonald's outlets opening the day after the revolution. Like Ishmael's aphasia when facing Moby Dick. I imagine Columbus must have fallen in love with the limitlessness of the ocean. He crossed the ocean to lose himself in the other, to rejoin and become one, a conquest, perhaps not driven by a malign force, but by the simple power of love the love of an anonymous mankind. Love my people. I felt this tension the most in my long career as a revolutionary. The time I was on the streets of Tehran, in the melting pot of two million plus ecstatic bodies. I can only describe the feeling as a mass reconciliation after a bitter breakup. All the guilt, the aggression, were lifted all of a sudden, and it felt like we could stay together forever. And once I thought that is how I would like to spend the time that was given to me on this earth. When they lose their faces, when we start losing things, I can almost always tell we're losing it. What is this momentary, ecstatic, effervescent loss of self, of everything? The feeling you attributed to a religious life, a prolonged sensation that you can maintain simultaneously to critical reason. I am sorry it took me this 600 years to respond to you, but it definitely robbed me of sleep. I thought about it long and hard, and it made me form my thoughts around civilization and unhappiness. I would definitely credit you for that. I would like to credit you for that. Space that you created within me. This is not a feeling 
I've encountered before. Not as far as I can recall. This sense of unbounded eternity. It is just like this place. A theme park, a joyride of potential futures. The eternal return of the revolution in layers of one's eternal futures, stacked above one another, bounded, safely constricted by water fountains, vending machines, and arcade machines. Hear me out. To keep sane, you need to be under the illusion that you're bounded by your skin. But it doesn't work like that. You're unbounded inside, deep into the black hole that knows no time. But the illusion of this skin boundary is broken when in love, turning one with the lover, with this theme park, with everything. If the theme park fell in love, would it become the world? Would it go back again to a time when I and you were one? It would become an ageless child. Losing our shell is reminiscent of a happier time. I myself am terrified of this feeling and I am desirous of this feeling. I'd much rather be up there. Let him rejoice who breathes up there in the roseate light. I do wonder though, in these 600 years, have I been defensive in trying to analyze your feeling? In fact, I feel that's all I've been doing in these 600 years, analyzing your feeling. Neither you nor I know the mysteries of eternity. Neither you nor I know the laws of eternity. Neither you nor I read this enigma. Neither you nor I can pronounce these words. You and I only talk this side of the way. We are just guessing about the secrets behind the whale. When the whale falls, neither you nor I will be here. When the whale disappears, there remain neither you nor me. For now, I cannot, I cannot reach you across the distance. At the end of the line, in this erotic conquest of time where I rupture the nautical map to all the stars and all the winds that you have claimed. But know that, on the edge of the horizon, once or where the waves have washed away and the sands have depleted, every last refuge, every last, every last island, and there is no more exit way left for you. I will tear open a new sky for you and invite you to gaze into a new sun with me, with me, without, without shame. Neither you nor I know the mysteries of eternity. Neither you nor I know the laws neither of eternity. Where neither now, you nor I cannot reach you. read neither this enigma. Across the distance. Neither you nor the I know the eternity. These words. These words. These words. These words. The nautical map. This mm -hmm. side of the way. Waves to all the stars. We are just guessing and the about the secret stars. It's in my way. Bye. 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 Bye.
When the way falls, but know that uh, where neither you nor I will be here. When the veil disappears to all senses, it leads me to the evidence. It leads me to the fundamentally change the way we love. You can check if trees can still grow. You can see if there is still movement left in the oceans. You can see if there are any songs written about it. <laughs> 